Welcome to The Art of Literacy with the National Council for Teachers of English. Uh, my name is Freddie Adelman. I have the distinct honor of leading the Smithsonian Associates. That is the institution's program for lifelong learning. This afternoon, I'm delighted to introduce you to our panelists. William Kist is joining us from Kent State University, and his achievements include developing curriculum, writing five books, including Curating a Literacy Life, receiving the Divergent Publication Award for Excellence in Literacy and Digital Age Research, consulting, coaching teachers, and perhaps most notably, teaching high school English. And joining him in conversation this afternoon is Emily Kirkpatrick. She is the Executive Director of the National Council for Teachers of English, and her illustrious career in support of literacy and social mobility has garnered philanthropic investment and attention from national media as she creates opportunities for literacy and the arts for students, teachers, and families. Please give a warm welcome to Emily and to William. Good afternoon, everyone. We're glad to be with you today and we'll settle into our slides. This is the second year that NCT has played a role in the summit and we're very, uh, pleased to be here and even more so recognize each of you who are attending and learning and prioritizing your professional growth and uh, service of students over the summer. You are our heroes and we, we honor you in this session. Let's advance our slides. And I think we can skip over our intro slides in the interest of time. Um, and. There we go. We're going to dive now into literacies and our conception of literacy. Over to you, Bill. I think we just wanted to start by, you know, pointing out that there is always a terminology issue when we talk about what some people call new literacies uh, or digital literacies. You know, there's uh, there are folks that are in the camp of visual literacy. Uh, there are some that prefer the term in, informational literacy, but we're really thrilled with being asked to be a part of this today because of the focus on the arts. We really uh, believe that uh, maybe we should have paid more attention to arts educators uh, as the internet came on strong. And um, the National Council of Teachers of English has been in the forefront for decades really of advocating for a broadened conception of literacy beyond reading alphabetic uh, uh, print. And so today our focus is gonna be, what are some of the things that you can do to bring in an arts uh, perspective into the English language arts classroom? And believe me, there are plenty. We had to work to cut it down to just about 45 minutes here today. And I guess we'll advance the slide. I think this is you, Emily. So NCTE has a very active uh, history in recognizing that uh, literacy and English language arts really represent an integrated set of skills that are necessary for all of us to pursue our passions and our imaginations about the world before us. And so we very much support a broad um, concept of what literacy is, both in the classroom and in the greater worlds. We recognize uh, very deliberately that film, that radio, that television, that media, and today's many technology platforms play significant roles in the development and uh, the pursuit and, and execution of literacy over one's life. So it's important to know that that's where we are coming from in this presentation. It is an integrated set of uh, both tools and assets in the world. When you hear us talk about texts, we are not referring to text only as a book, although we're very inclusive and we love books, uh, but we are also talking about the things before you on this slide, film, television, radio, et cetera. Let's advance to the next slide. 
So um, one important tool for you to know about and consider using is NCTE's definition of what literacy is in this very age. This is a definition that NCTE first published in the year 2019 or 2009, excuse me, and we updated again in 2019. And uh, the QR code before you provides easy access to the complete text, which is lengthy and it contains many cit research citations. But for the purposes of today, we encourage you to lift the fact that learners, that students today across all ages have access to a wide variety of text and tools and we engage with many of these multimedia texts from very, very young ages. And at a very young age, our students are participants in communities, whether that community is a classroom, a family, a neighborhood, and beyond. So it's very important to embrace the fact that um, our students now have um, information at their fingertips and at their ears from very young ages. And it's that information that leads us to understanding what our world is, what it's about, and what we're most curious about. Uh, let's lean into the next slide, please. Um, and Bill, I think this is over to you. This is still, I think, part of the NCTE position statement, but the, I just picked out a couple of key uh, strands. One is that uh, people consume, curate, and create actively across contexts. So this was a uh, uh, something that the group was advocating, and then NCTE uh, ratified it as being an official part of this position statement. As empowered learners engage in literacy practices, they need opportunities to move from consumers to producers of content. Let's go on to our next slide. So as we think about the assets available within the Smithsonian and beyond, and think about how we might expose our students to integrated arts, it's important to think about them as curators and then as producers for what they make and take away from uh, the art and other assets that uh, they may now have exposure to. NCT is also actively advocating for the growth of nonfiction literature in students' lives. And nonfiction literature has been uh, suppressed and not as valued in society as it should be uh, compared to uh, fiction. And so this is in no way uh, placating fiction or devaluing fiction, but it is augmenting uh, nonfiction and encouraging us all to see nonfiction in new ways, including as we're sharing here, uh, and we'll talk about in a minute, in artistic and visual forms. The QR code before you provides access to this important uh, and recent position that NCT has published calling for this expansion. And as you move through uh, this document that's a ready-made tool for you, you will see important inflection points and in instruction, whether it's informational literacy, visual literacy, and, and critical literacies. There are many ways to bring in nonfiction in an integrated way uh, in your teaching and learning. Let's advance to the next slide. Um, and moving forward uh, with that thought, um, we're really emphasizing moving forward that it's all about meaning making that helps us and helps our students deepen understanding and presents us with the opportunity to curate and compose and create in new and dynamic ways that really lead to um, integrated education and more importantly, integrated lives that bring in and out um, arts and the humanities in order to uh, live fulfilling lives. Let's advance to the next slide. Um, and so um, with visual literacy, we're advocating that English language arts professionals and perhaps all teachers can examine images, 
including primary sources and primary sources that are offered by the Smithsonian, by the Library of Congress, where NCT is an active partner, um, illustrations, um, and other styles, and examine those with criticality. What is being represented and why? And where is it uh, trying to lead uh, the viewer and the learner? And we're advocating for criticality. Um, also that uh, visual text uh, features are utilized in things such as photography and illustration and graphics uh, within nonfiction literature um, to both activate background knowledge as well as really important disciplinary inquiry. And again, we underscore with all of this the importance to in integrate, um, interrogate, excuse me, all visual representations. Again, what is what is being represented and why and what is not? Um, and whether this is in a primary source or in an artistic creation, this is very important um, technique and skill uh, to make sure that we all hold and we teach our children and our students to hold. Let's advance, please. And now over okay. to you, Dr. Kist. Yes, and this is just a little bit about me. This is back before my hair went gray. And uh, when I was in the classroom, I uh, was an English teacher um, in the Akron Public Schools in Akron, Ohio. And I used a ton of media, multimedia, film, video. This is me with a 16 millimeter film camera that I owned and the kids made made films and um, made music, made art as we read Shakespeare, as we read the great canonical works. Uh, and this was just as the internet was beginning to come in. So um, NCTE was always kind of my professional home when I would go to conferences. And it seemed like a lot of people were starting to talk about uh, this, even as I was doing it, in my own classroom with all these media tools. Let's go forward. <clears throat> and um, there is a long standing, very long standing uh, field of philosophy, really, called aesthetics that can help us um, really think about, um, you know, it's basically two main areas, the, the receiving or the reading of text and the producing or the writing of text. Um, and uh, Maxine Green, who is quoted here, is uh, one of the main scholars. We just lost her a few years ago, unfortunately, from Teachers College in Columbia, who, if you ever want to learn more about aesthetics in the K-12 classroom, I would urge you to just to look, look up some of her books. Let's go forward. Again, the aesthetics is, is the kind of receiving, the reading, the viewing, the listening, and helping students create the writing, composing, and drawing, et cetera. There are many different ways of reading, quote, reading and writing texts. And that's what we're kind of talking about today. How can that, how can we move beyond um, book, uh, focus on books and focus on paper? Uh, and focus more on these aesthetic principles, receiving and creating. And as Emily was talking, I was realizing something I wish we had put in the slides was the whole um, beginning of the term language arts. You know, the term language arts dates back to the 1950s. So there were people in our field of English language arts that were thinking about this way before the internet that there are the, all these different ways of receiving and creating. And um, so uh, this is really not all that new, but of course, all the new technology that we're carrying around in our pockets uh, makes it a much more accessible and doable thing. Let's go forward. There were people as the, uh, even again, before the internet, people like Elliot Eisner and uh, Howard Gardner uh, saying that we really need to do this to allow our classrooms to have cognitive pluralism uh, so that we're not limiting human thought. If we're just limiting kids to 
reading and writing print, we're really shutting them down. We're not empowering them. And certainly it's never been more true now. Um, you know, there's so many things that we need to help kids with that are um, that are online, things that they need to be able to do online, express themselves, read online. Uh, as Emily was mentioning a minute ago, the criticality piece, uh, we need to do this just to have cognitively pure, plural classrooms. Let's go forward. The literacies really allow us to do this. Um, and for the first time, again, we're, as teachers, we, most of many of us have, I mean, access to YouTube in our classrooms, have access to phones, tablets. Uh, I realize not all school districts have these resources. Um, so I think it's time to, instead of calling these books or films or sculptures, we're referring to them kind of generically as texts. Uh, I think this kind of mindset also helps us to break down that hierarchy that says that books are way up here and comic strips are way down there or songs are way down there, that it's, it's more of a level playing field. Let's go forward. A lot of the ideas that we're gonna be talking about for the rest of our presentation are in two books. One of them that I wrote, uh, Curating a Literacy Life, and one that I was honored to co-edit for NCTE and it has ended up winning an award. It is jam packed uh, with ideas. Every chapter is an idea that was pr uh, presented to us by a classroom teacher or by a professor who is studying uh, a classroom teacher. These are all ideas that are being done now, even in our current climate. Uh, these are these are people that teachers are able to do these things. So I would really encourage you to look at both books. My book is set in Cleveland at an urban high school called Glenville, which happens to be the uh, alma mater of the two men who created Superman, the comic strip Superman, so, or the comic book Superman. So um, lots of great ideas in these books. Let's go forward. And as we dive into these exciting ideas, we encourage you again to have the frame of, this is work that can be done on an and should be done on an ongoing basis. That's what NCT is advocating for. You know, it wasn't too far in our past where things like media literacy were seen as an add-on, something that you might dedicate a few days to, or there may be one day during the year where you would visit the local art museum or the local history museum, whatever local asset you may have. And in today's world, as Bill was noting, a, a classroom can travel from the Smithsonian in the morning to a local museum in Cleveland in the afternoon, and then in the morning visit the halls of the Library of Congress all through the internet. And so we're encouraging you to think about these ideas as truly integrated, where you may layer a book that you're teaching as one text with a set of illustrations and then a set of comics. And in so doing, as you're integrating these approaches, you're providing so many opportunities for students to engage, students with different interests, competencies, and backgrounds. And in that, we are truly building a classroom where everyone can belong and everyone can thrive. Back to you, Bill. And I think we're kind of modeling what what Emily is saying, we're modeling a kind of a way of being in the world. I know that when I teach this way, I have students after a while, they'll come in and they'll say, Dr. Kist, I saw this, this movie clip, or I saw this, um, the song lyric that made me think of something we talked about, or I saw this comic strip or meme, um, it's okay. I mean, I think when you let kids know that it's okay to bring in a meme uh, or a comic strip or a song lyric, um, then I think it's just a very liberating type of atmosphere in a classroom. And you know what? Then sometimes they come in and they'll say, uh, now, see, I was about to hierarchize, Emily. I was about to say something. They'll bring in something from Shakespeare as if that's like the pinnacle. We all have to be conscientious, right? 
Yeah. And but it's true. I mean, I think, and of course, we have nowadays we have all the the Baz Luhrmann um, versions of Romeo and Juliet and the Great Gatsby. So they can. I mean, kids are seeing my kids, my own children today were uh, showing me something that they found on YouTube. Um, I think it's just a modeling a way that's, again, liberating. It's exciting. It's fun. I mean, it's fun to, to um, you know, you, you might have noticed that I'm, I'm kind of purposeful in the way I structure my background. You'll see there's a little Gumby mug. This is Gumby. This is Mr. Bill. This is Yoda. Um, I try to make it fun for the kids and have them um, realize that we're all walking around now as potential curators. And so the rest of our uh, talk today is going to be structured kind of around this idea that I developed with the Cleveland teachers, that there are four steps we can think about with uh, curating, collecting, organizing, repurposing, and reflecting. And what a great place to be talking about this with the Smithsonian uh, Learning Lab as an example. Um, Emily, do you want to say anything about that? Um, no, I just want to encourage um, all of our participants here to share your questions and thoughts. And Bill and I want to make sure that uh, we have uh, time to hear from you. And we want to honor the experiences you have or your specific questions about how to do this. So uh, please let us hear from you in the chat. And we will make sure that uh, we address uh, your questions as best we can. We would love to hear from you so that we, we know that you're out there. We know you're out there, so uh, please uh, communicate with us. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is just briefly, I'll go through these. Uh, collecting, uh, in, in the collecting step, students learn close reading and aesthetic strategies because you can't collect everything. I mean, or else you'd be a hoarder. Um, so what are some principles and tools we can help kids with to figure out what should I keep on my phone? What should I keep on my laptop? Um, and what should I not? Um, what do I enjoy looking at? And what do I enjoy listening to? These are all aesthetic uh, tools that have been around for centuries. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, then once you've got stuff that you've been collecting on your phone or on your laptop or on paper, um, we need to organize it. Uh, students learn to look for themes, categories um, within their reading and viewing experiences. And again, the, the, the emphasis on is on the kid to do this organizing, not just follow the teacher's um, plan, but how would you like to organize your learning? Let's move forward. Okay, and then we get to the repurposing or creative uh, step. Now we have this, all of this material, how could we repurpose it somehow? Uh, and this is what people are doing all over, of course, on the internet. If you're familiar with TikTok, you're familiar with all the different, for instance, versions of songs that people are doing, remixes, mashups, they call them. Uh, how can we take all these texts that we've been, you know, reading and viewing and make them repurpose them so that they become our own? And then let's go on to the next slide. And then finally, there's always got to be a reflection, right? I mean, how, what did we learn from this? And what do we want to, where do we want to go next? Uh, what do we want to collect more of? What do we want to learn more about? Um, there's got to be a reflection stage. Let's go on. So our first strategy is pretty much uh, in the, it's a combination of co the collecting and the organizing, and it's text sets. Having kids collect texts across all different types of media, uh, focusing on a theme or a genre or an idea. The nice thing about this, and most of the ideas, if not all the ideas that we're going to be talking about today, can be done across disciplines. Let's move on to the next slide. 
So for example, let's say you're reading George Orwell's uh, 1984. You tell the kids, okay, I want you to go out, fan out, and take out your phones, which is, by the way, the title of a workshop that we're going to do this fall at NCTE um, on Sunday, November 19th. Um, take out your phones and let's find other texts that have similar themes. So this is one that uh, one of my students put together where um, he picked out a clip from Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin, a Popeye cartoon clip where Olive or Sweet Pea is stuck in the factory and like keeps going through the the assembly line and almost gets injured. Uh, the song in the year twenty five twenty five, the I Love Lucy clip with the the candy on the uh, conveyor belt. All sorts of different types. You'll see high art here. You'll see low art, so-called low art. Um, and kids can put these together in PowerPoint slides, Google slides. Also, any You could do it in an analog. I've seen kids do it like in a binder. Let's move forward. Oh, I forgot to mention the Walking Dead graphic novel. Um, mm -hmm. The next one is kind of aligned with this close reading of media. So this is where... Okay, they've got all these texts, let's say, that have dystopian themes. Let's take a, a, a look at one little clip, like a three or four minute clip. I used to use with this, and I still use it, um, the first uh, scene from the very first episode of the TV show Lost. I don't think we've ever talked about this, Emily. Are you Were you a Lost fan? I was not, but it was popular in my household. Yes. Well, um, my wife and I watched almost every episode of this. It did have a disappointing ending. Um, but the first episode is when they have the plane crash. And if you look at the first four minutes of the opening episode, it's really a great uh, clip that you can use with kids. You have them watch it one time with no comment. And then you break them into small groups and you say, okay, this group, I want you to focus on the music. This group, I want you to focus on the editing. And of course, some of the kids don't even know what editing is. So you have to kind of go over that. Uh, you could have them look at costuming, uh, sound effects, lighting. And then you watch the film clip again. And it is amazing how just giving them an assignment like that really gets them to do a very deep, close reading of movies, a movie clip. And in fact, sometimes they'll come back to me and say, Dr. Kiss, now I can't go to the movies because, or I can't watch a movie because I'm focused so much on these elements that I can't just enjoy it. And I said, well, you know, you can, it's good though that you are able to do this because the whole point of this is that you're showing them that filmmakers are communicating meaning. And they're using these tools in very intentional ways. So, uh, and I found that kids are really able to do this close meaning reading of media with film, music, uh, print. But then I'm always careful not to end with print. I'm always careful to go back then, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, so that you're not always ending with print. Or else it just becomes, as I wrote in one of my books, it's the spoonful of sugar that makes the print go down. Uh, you, you're going to get the reputation as the teacher that, oh, I'm just using film to get me to read 1984. No, that's not it. You're, you're just showing them how all these artists communicate in different media. Uh, they have the, the different ways of uh, signaling theme and genre and point of view and why shouldn't we know how to pick those things out as readers or viewers let's go on to the next slide okay and now during the organizing step students learn to look for themes and categories we already talked about this so let's go forward to the idea and you can imagine how this would apply in different elements of the language, English language arts in addition to media. 
So think about it in terms of other forms of visual representation um, or other forms of art, whether that be dance or uh, something different. You can apply when, when Bill is sh sharing examples that are specifically tied to media, you can think about this uh, with other uh, modalities and interest areas very easily. It's great that you mentioned dance because I was in a classroom in Canada one time where the, the English teacher let them do a multimodal capstone piece. And a couple of the kids did an interpretive dance. I forget what they were reading, but um, it was amazing. I mean, yes. it was just amazing seeing them them do that. And um, so going on to our next idea, the multimodal memoir is a way that uh, I sometimes start the year. So this is a good time to think about this. Uh, if there, I assume a lot of you out there are teachers listening to this. This is a great way to start your year. Have each kid do a multimodal memoir. Go back to your earliest text that you can remember, Dr. Seuss or a movie or a song. And uh, put those uh, texts usually in the form of a PowerPoint or a Google Slides, or sometimes I have students make videos <clears throat> that are like almost like a video documentary of their lives. And it helps to organize then all these texts into early childhood, middle childhood, adulthood, or it could be organizing it across themes. But it helps to to begin to chronological. Uh, there are different ways that we organize uh, the text of our lives, and I think the multimodal memoir really gets at that. Let's go on. And when I do workshops, we we actually do that, where we have people put together the texts of their lives and talk about them. And it is so fascinating to hear, like, what are some of your earliest memories? Uh, of TV or books. Um, As we think about the theme of this year's Smithsonian Summit, fostering belonging, um, honoring and leaning into uh, memoirs of students and students' origin stories as they see them at, at said point in their development um, can be a fantastic way. Uh, to create a culture of belonging and a culture of intentional inclusion among students and teachers and the greater uh, school atmosphere. Yeah, and I've done that multimodal memoir with kids as young as first grade, yeah. all the way up to senior citizens. And it's amazing, you know, especially when I work with high school English teachers, you know, you can just see again, the light bulbs go on. It's like, wow, this counts? This, this text counts as a legitimate piece of art? Yes, it does count, <laughs> you know, and, and it should be celebrated. And um, so I think, you know, the technology has helped us. I'm a glass half full person with technology. I, I really see a lot of, um, a lot of benefits that I know, you know, we see the doom and gloom folks out there, but I, I see a lot of benefits as a teacher, and I started teaching before the internet. Um, anyway, let's go on to repurposing. Here's where you put the burden a little bit back on the student to do some creating. Uh, what can you turn out now of your um, your collecting and your organizing? What, what stamp can you put on it? And let's let's move forward. A really common one that I'm seeing lots of teachers use these days is called book trailers. And I've seen, and, and that's all, all it is. Basically, you're reading a book or, or maybe the kids are each reading a book that they are have chosen. And they're supposed to put together a video that um, uh, advertises, similar to a movie trailer, uh, what the book is about. But similar to what Emily was mentioning a minute ago about the dance, I've seen everything from very literal, almost retellings of a book in a book trailer, all the way up to really highly abstract uh, visual poems, uh, kind of summarizing a book. 
Uh, so again, it, it puts, it gives a lot of creativity to the student to put that. And I'm sure we've all had that experience of, of, of witnessing a, a work of art or of um, uh, reading a book and then trying to put it in our own words or trying to summarize it. And, and maybe it's not always something that's real literal or a retelling. I encourage you just we to have do some we, we have some really encouraging comments and questions in the chat. Um, well, let's I'd, hear some I'd of like them. To interject, uh, Tammy shares that she uses Taylor Swift's Bad Blood to talk about alliteration, and she reports that students love it. Uh, so thank you for that, Tammy, and we, we would love to hear other examples. Uh, Bill, Sarah is asking, um, how or if you can translate this for younger elementary grades. And similar to this, Gladys is asking, as students become producers, what products are more age appropriate for elementary students? So two questions tied into the elementary age. Well, I appreciate the question because we really need our little kids doing these types of things. And you know what? I, I've done PowerPoints with first graders. I mean, I've I've shown first graders how to put together just a couple images in a PowerPoint slide. So if we're talking about the multimodal memoir, for example, just I've been in a classroom with, you know, where there's two or three adults and 25 kids and they get it. Uh, so that's one answer I would give you. Also, another answer, a quick answer I would give you would be it's okay to have them collect objects. So they could, in fact, Henry Jenkins does a memory object project. Uh, so you can have the kids perhaps going back to the classic show and tell. Uh, they bring in an object similar to what I have behind me, maybe a doll or uh, some kind of figurine or something, a picture. So it can be done that way. Uh, I think a lot of these things at the elementary level can be handled. I don't I should probably should use the word handled because that seems like I'm shoving it under the rug, but um, can be covered or done during morning message. If you're familiar with the morning, I'm sure any elementary teacher listening to this uh, knows that, you know, you, you assemble on the carpet for morning message. You talk about the weather, um, but you could also talk about, hey, what's a really interesting movie you've seen or a YouTube clip or a song that you've heard. So I, th I think there are a lot of ways that you can do this uh, with, with little kids. And uh, adding on to that, I was in a third grade classroom recently in the heartland of the country and the third graders created their own presentation on Google Slides available to almost everyone. Uh, preparing for preparing a presentation actually for their parent teacher conference. So rather than the parent asking questions to drive the conversation or the teacher uh, making assertions or talking about the student's work, the student created a technology based presentation that captured uh, the themes that they were most interested in learning, captured uh, objects and photography and video of um, ex significant experiences to them, where some were uh, examples of where they wanted to learn more, some were examples of things that they uh, did really well on and they wanted to um, talk about that and talk about their success. Uh, but it was uh, a great example of giving the control over to the student and also ha having the approach of this assignment be, let, let's curate and package the things that we want to talk about in this focused time of a 15 or 20 minute meeting. Um, I was really taken with that. I would have loved um, to have seen that. I bet that was great. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, Bill, another question is, um, and, and we know this exists, the hesitancy. This question is, how do you address hesitancy in teachers who are nervous to teach literacy with texts that are not books? And how do we encourage them to feel empowered to teach with art? That's a lot tougher than the early childhood question. <laughs> um, 
because, you know, I do encounter a fair number of teachers and they'll just say things just kind of like off the cuff, like the other, well, this is, I guess, about a year ago, uh, a, a high school English teacher told me, you know, I've never seen a single Star Wars movie. And I think that is a problem. <laughs> I mean, can you be a successful English teacher without seeing Star Wars? Yes. But she almost like she just kind of said it kind of off the cuff, like it wasn't a big deal. And I thought to myself, you know what? I, I think that is kind of a big deal. I mean, if especially if it's emblematic of um, kind of a, a system that she has in her classroom, I would say just if I, I'm assuming maybe that um, that question came from a, a a leader or a school leader and i would just say make sure that your teachers know that it's okay it's okay to use a clip from star wars it's okay to use a um a current pop song if you can find one that you don't have to edit out uh, but keep in mind there's kids bop there's the kids bop versions of pop um, i think you can just communicate to teachers that it's okay. You're not going to look down on them. Uh, I know a lot of schools are doing like book clubs, but but they're broadening it out into uh, film clubs. They're broadening it beyond just focusing on a book, but they're having teachers get together to talk about, let's say, a, a continuing TV series. Or I, I think it's just a kind of a frame of mind. Uh, you also, uh, one more thing I would say is you should certainly bring your arts teachers to the forefront. You know, the arts teachers are always down the hall. They're known as the specials. Um, they not, they're not special. They are special, very special, but they should become integral to everything we do. So get their input in some of that. I guess Fantastic. we go ahead. And, I, and then we need to move to another slide. Um, yes. But okay. I want to encourage everyone to continue asking your questions and we're going to get to as many as we can. We've and got 10 more like, minutes left. So just, just like Tammy, if you have other examples of what's working for you and you want to share it with the larger audience, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, Bill, do you want to go to this important yes, let's, slide on museum? Let's go to the yes, museum exhibit. This is another repurposing status strategy where you can have kids design their own little museum exhibit based on let's again let's go back to my dystopian theme from 1984 they could uh, make a little museum exhibit on George Orwell or other dystopian texts and I think it's important to say this is also important for the elementary teachers listening this can be done in digital or analog form I think it's important to give kids choices and there are kids that are tech resistant, just as there are adults that are tech resistant. If they want to make a diorama uh, for their museum exhibit, let them do a diorama. Let's go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> the bottom line, I think, of all this, I hope you're, you're detecting a theme coming through our presentation today, is that the English language arts classroom, classroom should be really a kind of salon where yeah. kids are exposed to all these different forms of representation. And I got this from another uh, Canadian teacher. The, our friends up north have really uh, paved the way, and also in Australia and the United Kingdom, in really looking at a broadened... Uh, conception of literacy. And he has this chart up on his bulletin board all year round. Uh, his name is Clarence Fisher, and I portrayed uh, or described his work in my first book. And like, he even has like things up there, like you can see, I don't know if you can read it, but like crossword puzzles, um, a wiki, which we don't even really use much anymore, diaries, PowerPoints, ads, what are things that you can do with these different forms that you can't do with other forms? To me, this is what the central conversation should be in our English language arts uh, classrooms, because the, the fact of the matter is, whether we like it or not, there are probably going to be 
doing a lot of their communicating, even on the job. Um, I had someone today, just today, ask me to send something, some link to something, and she wanted me to text it to her. She didn't want me to email it, and she certainly didn't want me to mail it in a U.S. postal mail. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we really need to have a dialogue with our kids. How do you even, you know, embed hyperlinks? I I see a lot of my undergrads that that don't know how to embed a hyperlink in a Word document. Well, it's not in the standards anywhere. Uh, should it be in the next version of the standards? I think it should be. Um, and if they listen to NCTE, they would uh, put this stuff in because NCTE has been advocating for decades. Um, let's go on to the next slide. I think we're getting a little bit close to the end. Yeah, we, we are. are. And we have a couple more questions. Oh, uh, good. One is, and I love this question, how, how do we see incorporating picture books in uh, secondary classrooms? And I love that question in the context of this conversation because it brings out that we're not advocating for an either or. It's an integration of. So thank you for that question. And Bill, what, what's your take as the secondary Well, teacher? I'm right with you. In fact, I do a whole thing with my pre-service teachers about bringing in picture books because, and I think the statistics on the book sales for picture books are for adults is amazing. Uh, there are a lot of adults that collect picture books. And so, yes, what a great way uh, of showing that pictures can support and, in fact, enhance or communicate ideas, perhaps more, um, in some cases, more strongly than alphabetic uh, print can. Uh, and, uh, but you, you know, you can pretty much go online and no matter what you're teaching isosceles triangles and you can find a picture book that could demonstrate that i've also seen that as an example of repurposing assignment where you have the kids design or create a picture book to teach a certain idea that's a great segue michelle offers to all of us that she's a proponent a visual poetry, creating visual media of written works. And I know that's something that NCTE has talked about. Uh, thank, thank you, Michelle. And uh, dovetailing from Michelle's comment, Sarah offers, and Bill, I think this is for you. Um, do you spend time focusing on teaching about aspects specific to other art forms? Uh, such as, or the example being given, how to storyboard, or what is film editing, or how do museum curators organize exhibits? The quick answer to that question is yes and no, because if I say yes to, to in a, too much of a forceful way, then I run the risk of turning off teachers and administrators who say, well, we don't have time for that. I will just say, I think you you can teach elements of editing, but it doesn't have to be like a five-part lesson. It could be done in five minutes. Uh, all this, a lot of this stuff can be kind of folded in to the types of lesson plans that you're doing. You are not, unless you're teaching a video production class, you shouldn't be spending days and days and days. And I think that's, that is, I'm really glad for that question because I think that's some, sometimes a pitfall uh, a teacher thinks, oh my gosh, I have to do this huge unit on film and how we communicate in film. But I just do a very simple exercise where we, like I said, the one where we watch the lost episode, that takes me like half an hour to get through. And then I, maybe like the next day I do songs, like songs that don't have words. Like I do um, something from Bach, the four seasons. And uh, I usually play the spring section of that. And how did Bach communicate the sounds of birds? You know, how did he do that? By using real high-pitched screechy violins. So then we talk about, you know, what can a musician do, you know, to affect, to give you that feeling of a spring, beautiful spring day that, a somebody writing a poem 
cannot do and vice versa. So I don't think it has to be anything belabored or lengthy. I know we're narrowing down to our last uh, minute or a uh, fewer seconds even. Um, and I will close with uh, acknowledging what Bill said. The English language arts classroom really can be a salon and should be such an exposure to a variety of um, text and, and literacy assets. And again, um, we advocate for everyone that it's it's not an either or, it's an integration of, and that is indeed how we live our lives as young adults and, and older as well. NCTE is here for you. We're proud to be an ongoing partner of the Smithsonian's and uh, welcome you into our organization at any time uh, to experiment with, to learn more about these ideas and to lead them into greater adoption in our field. Bill, parting comments from you? No, I think you said it so well. I think this is an exciting, I hope you got a feeling of excitement that we both have for this and that our organization has for this. And, uh, and please reach out to us if you ever try some of these ideas and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Great. We acknowledge the fantastic support of our team member, Lisa Fink, who's been moderating and raising your questions and great examples forward, um, as well as the incredible team uh, with us from NCTE. Thank you and thanks to the Smithsonian for gathering us for such an important conversation around education where we can all thrive and most importantly, all belong. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you today.